Rogue's Gallery Uncovered Bad Behaviour in Period Costume A non-judgmental exploration into the scandalous lives of history's greatest libertines, Lotharios and complete bastards. This podcast contains adult themes and a touch of colourful language. Of course it bloody does. Victorian Superman You name it, he's done it. And then written a book about it and then done it again, with Sir Richard Francis Burton. It's been a longer gap than usual between episodes, a situation that's arisen A, because I'm particularly busy at the moment with my day job, and B, because rather than spend all day every day tied to a microphone and a computer, I've accepted every social invitation that's come my way over the last few weeks, and had a thoroughly good time as a result. Writing about fascinating characters and telling their stories is great fun, but occasionally I do need to remind myself that life is actually for living, and you should jump in whenever you get the chance. A bit like this episode's subject, although I'd be hard-pressed to cram all of his adventures and achievements into two lifetimes, let alone one. Before we start, though, you may remember at the end of the last episode I introduced you to three entertainingly psychotic pirates and asked which one you'd most like me to feature the next time I did a pirate-themed episode. The choices were Charles Gibbs, who's said to have killed over 400 people and cut one poor chap's limbs off while he was still alive, Ned Lowe, who tied a captured cook to a ship's mast and then set him on fire because he looked greasy, and Daniel Montbar, who would disembowel prisoners, nail them to a tree, and then beat them to death with a burning log. Three proper charmers, as my old form teacher would have said. Thanks to all the rogues who emailed me at simon at roguesgalleryonline.com with their preferences, particularly Martin Smith, Paul Thompson and Paul Herman. Cheers, guys. The winner is the log-thrashing, Spaniard-hating Frenchman Daniel Montbar. He'll be getting flaming wood in an upcoming episode. Also, thanks to Tyler, who contacted me through the website roguesgalleryuncovered.com and suggested that I look into a gentleman by the name of John Addington Simmons, a gay 18th century Venetian rogue. I'll do exactly that, Tyler. Thanks very much. If you feel like getting in touch, you'll always find my email address in the show notes. Now, it feels like ages since I've said this bit. The following tale is written in the present tense of the period in which it's set, and as such may contain attitudes and opinions of the protagonists and their times, which would today be considered unacceptable. As I'm not a 19th century colonial polymath with a huge sense of superiority and an even bigger moustache, those attitudes and opinions are obviously not mine. I do wonder if I could carry off the tash, though. Trieste, Italy, 1886 Sir Richard Francis Burton, explorer, soldier, author, translator, spy, linguist, swordsman, orientalist, mapmaker, diplomat and poet, is furious. The reviews are in for his latest work, a translation of the 15th century Arabic sex manual The Perfumed Garden of Sensual Delight. The press are being far from kind. The Pall Mall Gazette called it a revolting obscenity. Another newspaper said that it was morally filthy. In America, the Boston Daily Advertiser described it as offensive, and not only offensive, but grossly and needlessly offensive. Since he was a young man, one of Burton's many, many, many fascinations has been the subject of sex and sensuality. He passionately wants to educate his repressed and guilt-consumed Victorian contemporaries about the benefits of a healthy and enjoyable sex life. Burton considers the perfumed garden, like the Kama Sutra and 1001 Nights, to be marvellous repositories of Eastern wisdom. Society, it seems, believes otherwise, and considers him little better than a pornographer. For Burton, this is just one more new challenge to overcome. Even at the age of 65, his remarkable mind just can't slow down. 
His office has 11 desks, each one devoted to a separate project. As he rants about sex to his adoring wife Isabel, a pious yet supportive Catholic woman, Burton reflects that it was easier to sneak into one of the most closely guarded places on earth than to convince the great British public that a good fuck would do them the world of good. At 15, Burton was already a wild and restless child. He'd grown up travelling around Italy and France, discovering a gift for learning languages and developing an appetite for life that simply wouldn't be satisfied. At school, he'd been disciplined for writing passionate love letters to local prostitutes, accidentally stabbing his brother through the face during a fencing match and smashing his music teacher over the head with a violin case. By the time he entered Oxford University in 1840, he was already experimenting with opium. If that was in order to calm him down, it was spectacularly unsuccessful. Within an hour of arriving at Trinity College, one of his fellow students unwisely mocked him for sporting a vast horseshoe moustache. Burton immediately challenged him to a duel. Such was his air of constant ferocity and immediate willingness to take umbrage, Burton was awarded the sobriquet Ruffian Dick. Clearly not suited to a life of gentle academia, he only lasted five terms before being expelled for attending a steeplechase without permission. Unleashed upon the world, Burton asked his father to pay for a commission into the British Army, a request his father accepted on the sole condition that Burton went to any lengths to see combat. Arriving in Bombay, his dreams of blood and thunder were somewhat dashed when he spent the first few weeks laid up in a bungalow suffering from explosive diarrhoea. The fact that he was sharing his lodgings with huge rats and a bunch of loud and permanently pissed fellow officers only made things worse. With a bottle of port his only companion, Burton waited until his guts had calmed down, then took himself north, learning as many Indian dialects as he could along the way. Staining one's face with walnut oil and talking to the natives in fluent Hindustani were not common activities for most Englishmen in India. After all, what's wrong with talking like Her Majesty? Burton, however, was different. One evening, when he bade an Afghan acquaintance goodnight in faultless English, the fellow, who was convinced that he'd been talking to a Gujarati merchant all week, nearly had a heart attack. Burton's linguistic gifts led to him becoming a spy travelling through the inhospitable hill country, reporting on the activities of various local tribes. It was a dangerous and living on a knife edge job that he absolutely adored. When he wasn't wrestling, horse riding or engaging in sword play with regimental sepoys, Burton relaxed by setting up home with a menagerie of 40 pet monkeys. He said that it was an attempt to study their behaviour and possibly learn their language. To further his research, he dressed his favourite monkey in pearls and invited it to sit at the dinner table, the better to instigate conversation. Simian linguistics, however, proved unfulfilling, so Burton dived into the much more enticing world of Indian sensuality. The open and joyous sexuality of the Indian women he slept with were a revelation for Burton, who considered European women flat and passionless by comparison. He was amazed that Indian women enjoyed sex so much that they did whatever they could to actually make it last longer. He wrote of one mistress, she cannot be satisfied with anything less than 20 minutes. He also observed that Indian men were so conscious of the need to satisfy their partner as well as themselves that they drank sherbet, chewed betel nuts and even smoked a pipe during sex. The reason for this ungentlemanly behaviour being to take their minds off having an orgasm too soon. In Karachi, Burton fell in love with a beautiful Persian girl, who had, he said, cheeks like sweet basil, and took to sipping bung, a popular local drink laced with cannabis. Burton's army career, however, came to an ignoble end, when he was asked to investigate rumours of homosexual brothels, that reports indicated were being regularly attended by British troops, including officers. His detailed investigations revealed three such establishments operating in Karachi. His report, however, was so graphic and matter-of-fact about the sinful sex and flagellation that occurred there, many suspected that he had done more than just observe. Driven from the army by rumour and innuendo, 
Burton decided that the only logical thing to do would be to travel to Arabia and sneak into Mecca while wearing a disguise, a feat that would mean certain death if discovered. In 1852, with funding secured, he set off for one of the holiest places on earth, posing as an Afghan pilgrim. To make his presence even more convincing, Burton had himself circumcised before he left. Knowing that months of hardship and danger awaited him, he spent a few weeks of preparation in Alexandria. Fine-tuning his plans, he set aside plenty of time to relax with local prostitutes, who would always begin a tryst by performing the traditional dance known as Al-Nahal, or the Bee Dance. Burton found these women dangerously seductive, but they did put him in fine fettle for the journey ahead. With nothing more than a small tent, a bag of water, an umbrella, a pistol, a knife and a rosary that he said, at a pinch, could be used as a weapon of offence, Burton set off into the blazing desert. The weapons were a good idea because shortly after the expedition left Alexandria, they were attacked by Bedouin raiders and 12 of their number were killed. Continuing their journey, they watched as a roadside argument between pilgrims led to one of them being stabbed in the stomach and left to die. It wasn't like travelling in England. Despite the danger, Burton was having the time of his life. Your morale improves, he wrote. The hypocritical politeness and the slavery of civilization are left behind you in the city. When he finally arrived at Mecca, Burton's confidence, fluency and complete immersion in the character he was portraying meant that he was accepted without question as a pilgrim from Afghanistan. Mingling with thousands of fellow pilgrims, he enthusiastically took part in their rituals and made surreptitious sketches of all that he saw. Knowing full well that if discovered he could be impaled or crucified, Burton, determined to see inside the holy shrine, allowed himself to be lifted up by the guards so he could climb through the entrance situated seven feet off the ground. Having seen what less than a handful of Western travellers had ever witnessed, and with his curiosity temporarily satisfied, Burton returned home. Shaking the sand from his boots, he immediately wrote a best-selling book about his experiences. By the following year, though, he was bored. He announced that he wanted to become the first European to visit the forbidden Ethiopian city of Hara. A few months later, he was in West Africa. Making his way across the continent in the guise of an Arab named Haji Mizra Abdullah, Burton became dangerously ill as he got closer to his destination. Slumped beneath a tree, close to death, he cut such a wretched figure that even the locals burst into tears when they saw him. Death, however, was for lesser men, and Burton gave himself a severe talking to, picked himself up, and finally arrived at Hara, knowing once again that if discovered, he'd be executed. Exploring the city, he decided that even his formidable disguise skills couldn't fool everybody, so he took himself straight to the palace and bravely revealed himself to the emir. The emir, fortunately for Burton, a capricious man, chose not to execute him on the spot. Instead, he kept him as a guest for ten days. A virtual prisoner under constant threat of execution, Burton passed the time by sleeping with the Gala slave girls who, he was amazed to discover, could bring a man to orgasm simply by sitting astride him and contracting their vaginal muscles. Stars are tattooed upon the bosom, he wrote. The eyebrows are lengthened with dyes, the eyes fringed with coal, and the hands and feet stained with henna. With his curiosity totally satisfied, for the moment, Burton then wisely took his leave of Hara, before the emir's welcome evaporated. Although invigorated by his escape, Burton's return to civilization was not without its upsets, and he nearly died of thirst as he made his way to the coast. A chance meeting, though, with some fellow British explorers saved his life. After regaining his strength, and of course thanking them effusively, Burton decided not to go home after all, but instead returned to the interior with his newfound friends. Unfortunately, before the expedition had even left their beachfront camp, they were attacked by a party of Somali warriors. In the ensuing battle, as spears fell among the beleaguered Brits, Burton turned to hack with his sword at what he thought was an attacking warrior, only to discover that it was actually one of his companions. Momentarily distracted, one of the Somalis took the opportunity to shove his spear straight through Burton's face, piercing both cheeks and knocking out four of his teeth. Burton left the spear where it was and, looking a little like a dog retrieving a stick, carried on fighting. 
Finally, with his mouth still pinned shut, he managed to escape to a friendly ship which had dropped anchor just offshore. Returning home with a scar that was the envy of his friends, Burton decided to relax by commanding a troop of irregular Turkish cavalry during the Crimean War. When they mutinied, though, a disappointed Burton went back to England and spontaneously proposed to his longtime sweetheart, Isabel. The moment, though, that she'd said yes, he then romantically took himself back to Africa, this time to look for the legendary source of the Nile. The source of the Nile was one of the biggest prizes in Victorian exploration, and Burton, along with his friend and fellow explorer John Hanning Speak, were determined to find it. African mosquitoes, however, had other ideas. Burton became paralysed by malaria and had to be carried around on a litter. Speak became incapacitated when a beetle burrowed into his ear and he tried to dig it out with a penknife. The resulting infection left him deaf and with a hole in his septum so large that whenever he blew his nose, it emitted a loud whistling noise. Then he went blind. It was not, though, as if Speak had been an ideal travelling companion to begin with. He was a typically repressed Victorian who would go into the vapours at the merest sight of a naked native woman. Burton's meet new people and then fuck them in interesting ways approach to exploring was already driving him mad. He was also teetotal, so Burton's liberal use of medicinal booze further added to his moral misery. Raving in delirium, the two swollen-eyed friends bickered their way through East Africa until they stumbled upon the shores of Lake Tanganyika. They had accidentally made a major discovery, but it wasn't the one they were looking for. It was most definitely not the source of the Nile, so after a few months, they turned for home. On the way back, Burton continued to fraternise with every woman he met, noting that many were well disposed towards strangers of fair complexion, apparently with the permission of their husbands. He also spent quite a lot of time looking at local men's penises, presumably for scientific study. Burton arrived home a yellow-skinned walking skeleton and immediately got into a huge public argument with Speak about the details of the expedition. He also got married to his now long-standing fiancée Isabel, who had been patiently waiting for him for three years. It's said that he arrived at church in a rough shooting coat while vigorously chewing a cigar. Seven months later, the radiant newlywed took a job as consulate on the West African island of Fernando Po, leaving Isabel behind in London. Living with cannibals and hunting gorillas was business as usual for Burton. He made two visits to the feared Dahomey people, famous for their practice of human sacrifice and for their regiment of savage warrior women. I've been here three days and am generally disappointed, Burton mused on his first visit. Not a man killed or a fellow tortured. On his second trip, however, his hosts put on a bit more of a show and executed 80 prisoners. The king even chopped one of their heads off himself. There followed additional postings to Brazil and Damascus, but Burton was finally running out of steam and beginning to drink even more heavily than before. Relocating to Trieste in Italy, the grand adventurer took to wandering around the house in a fez and pointy slippers. He became so bored and frustrated that he disturbed a genteel tea party that his wife was hosting by storming in and slamming a manuscript entitled The History of Farting down on the table in front of her. By 1886, his body may be slowing down, but Burton's mind is still terrifyingly active. For many years, he's been sharing his sensual interests with a select group of forward-thinking London intellectuals who call themselves the Cannibal Club. These include the poets Richard Monckton Milnes and Algernon Charles Swinburne. If anyone is qualified to critique his work, it's them, not some damn scribbler of a journalist, needlessly offensive indeed. In his much-resisted old age, the author of over 50 books is finally beginning to make some serious money. Burton's translations of erotic Eastern text, which he published anonymously at first, are at last finding a wider modern audience, even if the more prudish elements of the press are up in arms. It may take a while for Victorian society to loosen up, but if anyone can rise to the challenge, it's Richard Francis Burton. I could, and probably will, devote at least another episode to the amazing adventures of Sir Richard Francis Burton. 
The short ending to this tale, however, is that after travelling all over Europe, searching for a cure to the gout which had plagued him for several years, including drinking medicinal waters in the Tyrolean mountains, Burton retired to his home in Trieste in 1890 and died there a year later at the age of 70. Worried in case, as an atheist, his soul might end up somewhere nasty, his wife Isabel rushed a Catholic priest over to give him the last rites at the last minute, and he was buried in a full Catholic ceremony. Their joint mausoleum at Mortlake is worth checking out if you're ever in London. Designed by Isabel, it's in the shape of a huge marble Bedouin tent. Now, Burton was an adventurer and a Renaissance man, in the truest sense of the word although his almost compulsive need for new experiences and knowledge, combined with his mercurial temperament, meant that he didn't always make the most of his achievements. An obituary, written shortly after his death, obviously, read, He was ill-fitted to run in official harness, and he had a Byronic love of shocking people. And in my book, you can't say much fairer than that. Speaking of books, I found out that Burton had a novel way of getting around the Obscene Publications Act of 1857 when trying to get his more arousing literary works in front of an appreciative audience. According to the Act, you could go to jail if you published anything that contained, and I quote, excessive drinking, blasphemy, profane swearing and cursing, lewdness, profanation of the Lord's Day, and other dissolute, immoral, or disorderly practices. I try and get all of that into every episode of Rogue's Gallery Uncovered, but to avoid the heavy puritanical arm of the law, Burton founded the Karma Sastra Society and gave copies of his work to all of his subscribers. It didn't make him much money, at least not officially, but at least he got his message across. His ten-volume translation of The Arabian Nights, however, was sellable and netted him around £10,000, which is over a million in today's money. A lot's been said about his wife Isabel's burning of loads of his papers once he'd died. She destroyed a treasure trove and has rightly got a bit of flack for it, but her intentions were always good. She was determined that nothing would be found to sully her husband's reputation. You could get yourself cancelled ten minutes after you'd died as easily then as now it seems. When people took her to task for burning these priceless documents, Isabel was adamant that Burton's spirit had got in touch with her from the hereafter and told her to do it. And in very religious Victorian England, you couldn't really argue with that. There's also an episode to be made about the Cannibal Club, the dining society founded by Burton and an eminent speech therapist called Dr James Hunt. The aim of the club, one author has written, was to create an atmosphere where subjects deemed deviant by society could receive an open airing. So it will certainly feature in a future rogues gallery uncovered. I'll leave the final quote to Burton, as he attempted to explain just why he simply couldn't keep his mind or his body in one place for very long. Of the gladdest moments in human life, methinks, is the departure upon a distant journey into unknown lands. Shaking off with one mighty effort the fetters of habit, the leaden weight of routine, the cloak of many cares and the slavery of hope, one feels once more happy. The blood flows with the fast circulation of childhood. A journey, in fact, appeals to the imagination, to memory, to hope. The three sister graces of our moral being. Next time on Rogue's Gallery Uncovered. Hey hey, we're the Mohawks. Get shit scared and stay indoors as a demonic gang of teenage hooligans terrorise 18th century London. Or do they? The busyness of summer seems to be meaning that I'm producing episodes once every fortnight rather than weekly at the moment, and I hope that's okay. I plan to begin normal weekly service when the rest of my life calms down a bit. Thanks for sticking with the podcast and I hope you're still enjoying my roguish tales. Don't forget to tell your friends. And if I can take this opportunity for a little bit of cheeky salesmanship, also don't forget that Rogue's Gallery Uncovered has its own stylish range of t-shirts and mugs available at, of course, roguesgalleryuncovered.com. Link to both website and store is in the show notes. While the sun's out, you can look quite the dapper degenerate by sporting a short-sleeved statement tee, featuring a quote from your favourite episode or quaff a cooling beverage of your choice from a flagon-sized mug emblazoned with the same. 
I was resplendent in an I'm a lovable rogue t-shirt during the recent heatwave in the UK and, combined with a straw hat and a jaunty air, felt quite the Beau Brummel. Whether you shop roguishly or not, it's always great to hear from you at simon at roguesgalleryonline.com. Historical suggestions, tales of period costume naughtiness, thoughts on the podcast, all are welcome. Until next time, stay roguish, have a great week, and I'll see you yesterday.